Foundation are a community foundation that has been in this region for about 51 years. Um, and we serve a six county area all the way up in Merced, Mariposa counties, um, down to Madera, Fresno, Kings, and Tulare counties. And um, we are a community foundation and we really work with local, the local donor community to make sure that our um, we're aggregating investments on the community and really have a community impact. So um, this is an initiative that we have stumbled into for a variety of reasons and um, are really um, happy to be here, really happy to the Black Chamber for having us um, to, to talk with you all about this really important initiative for Fresno and the ways in which we're trying to work with the community as we go forward. Actually, let's, let's keep there. Should I just tell you what I want to move on? Okay. Um, so, I'm assuming that most of you know what TCC is, but just want to be clear, who doesn't know what TCC or Transformative Climate Communities is? Okay, so we'll do a quick overview. So, um, I will not worry about that. So, um, who has heard of the 70 million coming to Fresno? Does that sound familiar to everyone? <laughs> that, okay, great. So, they are the same thing. So, um, Back in uh, October, um, there, uh, or sorry, let me start back a little bit further. Back in September, uh, the governor made, came to Fresno and signed a bill called AB 2722 that was authorizing a program called Transformative Climate Community. It's a new program that was created by the state legislature with the intent of taking all of these different strands of programs that the state funds through their cap and trade auction program, which is their climate money, their climate investment program. And they take all these different programs that exist. So they fund affordable housing near transit. They fund energy efficiency retrofits in you know, low income buildings. They fund um, new transit infrastructure. They fund new parks. They fund green infrastructure. All these different programs. But all these programs exist in a silo. Um, they're not co-funding in a lot of different places. And they're not necessarily making an impact uh, to really lift up uh, the disadvantaged communities of the state, which the, that there's a lot of intent to do with cap and reduction proceeds. So TCC, Transformative Climate Communities, was, was formed in, in essence to take all these different strands, combine them into one program, and really invest in a major way and a few places throughout the state that are some of the most disadvantaged communities in the state. So the state has their own way of how they measure what a disadvantaged community is. It's called Cal Enviro Screen. It takes a, a ton of different indicators that look at both environmental exposure and um, exposure to pollution and other toxic hazards. And then it takes another series of indicators that look at socioeconomic status, combines them into one index, and that becomes your, your measure of disadvantaged community. Well, it so happens that in Fresno, we have some of the highest concentration of disadvantaged communities in the state. And uh, about 40% of the census tracts in the city of Fresno actually rank in the, what they call the top 5% of disadvantaged communities. <coughs> so that being the reality that we have in Fresno, um, the governor, after he came to Fresno and signed this bill that authorized this new program, said, I want to see this investment happen in Fresno first. And so he then basically went through a legal process to set aside 50% of all the funds for this next year for transformative climate communities would be spent in Fresno and the city of Fresno specifically. LA gets their own set aside, but they get half of what we're getting. We get 70 million, which is half of the 140 that was put in the state budget. LA gets 35 million. So to say that this is a priority for the governor in, in Fresno is, is an understatement. They're making a huge investment here. So that all happened last year, and we have spent the last several months um, in a process of figuring out how the money could be spent, where the money could be spent, um, what, how this works, and um, this is a state process that as local agencies we're all sort of falling into, and so I think that's important as I go through the slides to keep in the back of your mind that at the end of the day, this is the state's money. They're the ones that set the rules, and we follow the rules. And we'll do the best that we can to follow the rules, but they are the ones that have set them. Um, so before I get into process, just one more. Um, so I'm going to go through what our local process is going to look like today. Um, as you might imagine, when $70 million drops into Fresno, there's a ton of interest in figuring out how it's going to be spent. And um, there have been a lot of uh, conversations that have happened over the last several months on the best way to do that process. 
Um, because the city is required to be at the table, um, this is you know $70 million and the, most of it is infrastructure money, meaning that it needs to flow through an agency that has the capacity to execute large infrastructure projects. And in Fresno, the city is, is mostly the, the main entity that is able to do that on a reimbursement basis because these are reimbursement grants for the state. So um, there's been a lot of talk and earlier this year, there was a um, steering committee that was formed, and it was um, initiated by Councilmember Oliver Baines, and he chaired that committee and appointed about 30, I want to say 35 people to be on that committee, representing a lot of the different interests and entities from downtown, Chinatown, and Southwest Fresno. And my organization, the Central Valley Community Foundation, was brought in to chair that, or not chair that, to staff that steering committee, and really shepherd a, a process through that steering committee of how the funds will be sent. Well, um, after many months of, of conversations with a lot of uh, community groups, um, there was a, a, a realization that there is a lot of interest in this money. And having those conversations only within the confines of steering committee was not going to cut it for right now. And so we made the decision to open up our steering committee. And we, um, some of the others who were on that steering committee that did not make any decisions, that was just, it was an informational meeting that happened. And we went to our steering committee and we said, thank you for your service, and we are going to disband you. And we're gonna start over from a process perspective, and we're gonna invite the community to come in and really be empowered as decision makers to help us figure out how to spend this money. <laughs> so that's where we are now. We have, um, disbanded the old steering committee. We're starting new. So there's been a lot of conversations about, hey, I thought this was a process that had been all figured out. This is just, you know, rubber stamping something that's already been in place. <laughs> Not the case. We are really starting from scratch here. Um, and there are pieces in motion. So it's, you know, it's not a total scratch, and I'll go through that in a second. But I just wanted to kind of give you all that background to understand that we have been trying to be adaptive and flexible as we hear folks from the community say we want to be involved in this process of how we spend this money. Okay, so with that, um, so one more thing on the last slide. Um, so we have a structure of our process and we call it the Fresno Transformative Climate Communities Collaborative. And we call it this for one, a number of reasons. One being that a collaborative indicates that we need a lot of voices at the table. And we need the residents of the places where this money is going to be spent. We need the organizations and institutions that will stand in those communities, that support those communities, that fund you know, affordable housing and anti-poverty measures and business development. We need all of y'all at the table in a lot of different ways, and everyone needs to have a role to play. And we're still figuring out exactly how that structure goes moving forward, but we know that this is a community effort and we need everyone at the table because the city below can't achieve an impact. The Central Valley Community Foundation alone can't achieve an impact. We need a lot of people at the table. And what we say is we are working on identifying investments that will catalyze transformation in Southwest Fresno, Chinatown, and downtown. And I'll get in more uh, later into the slides on why those specific areas. Um, a lot of it, again, goes back to the state and what they're trying to do. Uh, but that's really been our focus for the lab. Okay. So let's talk about our Fresno process. Uh, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about roles. So when I talk about the state being the funder, they're a, the agency that's really over this is the State of California and California Strategic Growth Council. They're an interagency uh, council that has formed a lot of the uh, governor's appointees of different, uh, different uh, secretaries. So you have the Secretary of Transportation, you have the Secretary of, of Housing and Community Development, you have the Secretary of EPA at the table, a lot of different secretaries. And their task was really to think about you know, this sort of holistic picture of how we do climate investments in a way that really serves disadvantaged communities throughout the state. So they're our funder at the end of the day, we respond to them. City of Fresno, uh, I don't see anyone in the city here today, so I won't point anyone out. But the city is the fiscal agent and the lead applicant for the funds. You just want to. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. H, now I can put you on the spot. Okay. Be ready for it. Um, so the city is the lead applicant for the funds. Uh, the state requires through their funding guidelines that a public agency be at the table um, in some role, in some cases that might be lead, some places that might be a 
co-applicant in Fresno, the way that's taking shape is that the city's going to be the lead. They have the fiscal capacity to take on large infrastructure projects on a reimbursement basis. Um, they are doing that now. You see a lot of construction happening around the city. The city is able to execute. Um, so they're, and they're going to be the ones responsible for ultimately writing the grant at the end of the day. They have you know, several grant writers on staff that are very capable, that have written a lot of uh, state grants in the past, know what the expectations are. So that's their goal. Community representatives. So that's what we're calling our community steering committee. That's what I was referring to a few minutes before. So we did have a steering committee, disbanded. We have a new steering committee. It's called the community steering committee. The membership requirements for this community, steering committee is to show up if you live or work or own property in Southwest Fresno, Chinatown, or downtown. And that's all we're asking, just show up. If that's if you live or work or own property in that area, then you show up, you're a steering committee member. You get to make decisions. So that's that's a new thing. I will just I will keep saying this. It's a new thing for us at the foundation, it's a new thing for the city. I think it's a new thing for a lot of folks in the community, and we're learning. This is a learning process, and we're doing it really quickly, um, and we're open to a lot of feedback as we go forward, but this is, this is the process that we're undertaking. Staff. So, at the foundation, I am the main person staffing this effort. We're a pretty small team, and we do a lot of other things besides this. So, I'll be the main person that you'll see from the foundation, and I'm really kind of running the day-to-day, -day, just making sure that um, our meetings are getting underway, that we're getting the communications out, we have right people in place on the grant writing team and on the engagement team and all of these different things. So I am one of many moving parts. At the city, we have HCs. H, raise your hand. He's the director of strategic initiatives. He's the rep from the mayor's office on the initiative. Um, we have another person, Laura Gloria, who's not here today. She's the representative from the city manager's office on the initiative. And then we have a facilitator that the city has hired. Uh, his name is Steve Kansian, and he's based in LA, and he comes up here a lot to Fresno for a lot of different projects. So though that four, the four of us, Steve, myself, H, and Laura, we're the sort of the core team, really doing a lot of the parts on this. Um, we have a lot of other people that we work with, and it's our goal by the end of this process to have it just be a lot more than the four of us. We know that we're not necessarily representative of the community, we want to be inclusive. We're also moving really fast and trying to figure out how to do that in, a, in an expeditious way. Finally, last role piece, project developers. So if I had a whiteboard up here, I do have a whiteboard, I don't have markers, and it might take me a long time to draw it. So maybe I should have <laughs> I will, maybe. Um, so we have two strands. We have community decision making, which is our community steering committee. Making, helping us make decisions on how the money actually gets spent. And then we have another thread, which is project development. And that's the process that I'm gonna get to in a second. So we're putting this money out here, and there's going to be a lot of interesting ideas on how to spend it. And we're creating an open proposal process so that if you have an interesting idea on how to spend the funds, and you uh, are able to put that idea together and it fits the funding criteria that the state has put out, propose it. We're going to be putting out an RFP next week. Um, so we're trying to create a really open environment to encourage and nurture creative ideas and really make this a, a transformational process for our community. Okay. Any questions on this before I move forward? Great. So let's start with project development. This is one of the threads of the process. This is the project side. So there's been a lot of conversations that folks have had and said, the city already has a bunch of projects, and you know, why are you going through this process when well, we know you already know what you want to find? It's not, it's not untrue that the city has a lot of projects. The city goes through a lot of community planning processes to help them identify projects that they can fund in the future. And so um, last year, last October, the city adopted a Fulton Corridor specific plan that's really for the core of downtown. They funded a downtown neighborhoods, or they approved a downtown neighborhoods community plan, which includes the downtown triangle and then a lot of the core uh, pre-World War II historic neighborhoods surrounding downtown. Um, and those got adopted, and those have projects in them. And those projects went, were vetted through uh, community planning processes, and folks came to workshops and helped identify what would go with that. So there are projects in there. Now, those are mostly um, street infrastructure, park infrastructure projects. 
but nonetheless, there are projects in there. We also have a Southwest Pacific plan in Fresno that's almost done. Um, it's supposed to be adopted in October by the City Council. That will also have some projects in it. So there's a lot of projects that come out of the planning process that the city, that's just a function of what the city does, and it's how they figure out how they plan for the future and how they allocate funding. So that being said, we know that there's projects in that universe. There might be other projects that come out of this process from the community. And someone might have an interesting idea on how to weatherize um, a lot of homes in a, a, a disadvantaged neighborhood in Fresno that fits in the project area. That's not a project that would be in those plans, but that's an eligible project under the funding criteria. And that would absolutely be something that should come through our process and be considered for funding. Um, there might be other ideas that aren't in the plans and our goal is to help nurture those ideas, figure out how to make sure that they are, um, you know, can fit the box that the state has fit for us. And if they don't fit that box that the state has fit for us, how do we still make it a successful project? If you have an idea for a health clinic, which is something that TCC in and of itself cannot fund, that's still a great thing and it's necessary in the community. How do we find a path to get that funded? Um, so that's, that's what we want to do. So all of the projects will have to go through the RFP process. No project will be considered for funding if it doesn't have an official proposal submitted with it. So everyone, including the city, has to submit a project through the RFP process. And through that, there's going to be technical assistance both from the state. So the state has hired a technical assistance provider and they have a lot of subs that have different expertise on how to prepare state grant applications. So they're going to be available to help people um, you know, understand the guidelines and does my project fit within the guidelines and what do I need to make sure that my project's ready. And then the city is also going to be making themselves available in weekly consultations to talk to folks to make sure that, you know, if you have an idea for doing a streetscape project in your community, that you're talking with the city because at the end of the day, and it's the city's public works department that's going to have to execute that project, um, and making sure that you all are aligned and in sync on, on the proposal. So that will all happen in the month that the proposal period is open. Then everyone will submit their projects to our collaborative. Um, due date is September 12th. I'll have a calendar just a few slides. You'll get to see the dates. But we'll be having this project. Everything, everything has to be submitted to the by the 12th. If someone has a project and it doesn't get submitted by the 12th, it's not going to be eligible for funding. It's not going to be you know, wedged in in some back conversation. That's it. That's done. Any questions about this slide before we move on? You said the 12th of what? September. It's fast. Okay, next slide. So this is our selection process. So I just went through projects. That's the one strand, how projects get developed. This is the other strand, how projects get decided. So everyone that has a project idea, they submit their, their project through the RFP process. Um, which will close on the 12th. Um, after that happens, then we are going to be doing uh, what we call project review day. And uh, project review day isn't this, this slide, but it's, it's, I think it's important piece. So we want to have a public meeting or workshop where all of the projects that get submitted, and let's say we have 100 projects come through the door, all 100 of those projects we want to be on display for the community to see. We want um, folks to be doing presentations to the community so that anyone can understand what's been submitted, what ideas are out there in the ether. And again, part of the reason we're doing this is both to help our steering committee really understand what's out there before they start having to make decisions, but it's also that we want our community at large, the larger Fresno community, even if you're not on the steering committee, to understand what projects are out there and also to figure out how we get stuff funded if it's not eligible for TCC. Because we know that not everything's going to be eligible for the funding. And we don't want this to be the dead end for a, a great idea. We want ideas to keep going. So that's what we're going to be working on. So after project review day, then um, our steering committee will go through uh, their fourth meeting, which will essentially help rank projects and, and do the process of starting to um, for, you know, practice assembling projects into proposals. Because again, the 70 million is going to fund multiple projects. Every individual project has its own set of guidelines and funding criteria set by the state that they have to make, meet in order to be eligible for the funding. 
but that's different than what how the full package of seventy million dollars of projects is going to be evaluated. So, um, in that, there's a lot of guidelines that go into looking at the package as a whole versus a project individually. So, one example um, is match. A lot of people have been really concerned because the state is requiring a fifty percent match requirement for this proposal. The match requirement doesn't require isn't applied to an individual project. You could submit a project through the process of zero match and absolutely still be eligible for funding. It's your project will, part of its viability within the entire package depends on what other projects get accepted that do bring match to the table. And we know that there are some projects that lend themselves more easily to contributing match than others. Housing projects is a great example. If you fund affordable housing with TCC, there's a lot of other funding sources that come into play that can be counted as match, just that's just the nature of how affordable housing is financed. There's you know, state tax credits, there's other private financing that comes in. That's all included in the match. So, you know, it's a complicated um, game, I guess, to, I don't know if that's the right word. It's a complicated art in assembling projects that meet all the state's criteria and we want our steering committee to sort of get in the hang of how you do that and what you, all the factors you have to consider to do that in the way that meets the state's guidelines. So that's, that's going to happen after project review and after the projects come through. Then after that fourth meeting of the steering committee, then we'll have a final meeting in which folks will have a series of packages. All that meet the 70 million, so we'll have, you know, I don't know how many there will be, but there will be a couple, and they will, might have a different focus. So one might focus on um, priorities that have been surfaced, and people really want to see a package that optimizes for criteria of pollutant reduction and making sure that, you know, we're doing a good job at, at um, mitigating a lot of the diesel pollutants that are in the atmosphere. Um, another project might optimize for working with local businesses. Another project might optimize for maximizing the amount of affordable housing. And so all of those packages will be brought forward. All of them will meet the state's criteria and guidelines. And then the steering committee will vote. And they, whatever they decide, and they have to achieve a two-thirds threshold. So that could take some time to get to two-thirds, but that's, that's what we've set forward. Um, whatever they take with two-thirds, that's the package. That is, that is what gets submitted. Now that does go through the mayor's office. They have to ultimately do all of the crossing of the T's and the dotting of the I's and making sure that the proposal um, you know, meets every single tiny little requirement that the state has to do. So they have about two weeks to do that in every general, that's not a lot of time. Um, but it's, it's what we have to do because we're working on the state's timeline, not ours. Um, so that's going to happen and then the city council will not vote on the package. We'll do a workshop with them and just say, hey, guess what? This is what we've decided as a community committee. Um, this is informational. We don't need a resolution from the city council in order to take this to the state, so we're not going to get one. Um, the city council is interesting in present. So um, then after that, it gets submitted on October 18th, and, and that's, that's the process. Um, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so here's our calendar of all of the upcoming meetings. Um, you can see it's a really fast timeline. And this is something that we don't control locally. This is a state mandated timeline. And uh, well, I guess the state date is really this last one of October 18th, and so we had to work backwards to that date. So I'm gonna stop here and see if there's any questions. I have a question. Yes. At the meeting that we just did that I was at the steering committee there, and you said that you guys were gonna take it to the city council for approval. So that's changed from last Wednesday to now? Uh, the last week, on the last um, meeting, we said that we would do a workshop. This is the same slide we submitted. Workshop. So they're not going to vote or approve on anything. All you're doing is just presenting what's already been approved, and they don't get any input in that. Okay. Yeah. At the first search committee meeting, we did say that we were going to the top. the first one. Okay. Yeah. We decided. Our steering committee, if they really want the city council to vote on it, then we should talk about it. But I don't necessarily think we should. I just want to make sure I was yeah. clear from one meeting yeah. to the next. What was going on? Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there a website that sort of like uh, talks about everything what you yes. said? Yes. Um, you want to go to the last slide? Mm -hmm. There is one. Okay. Yes. Transformresident.com is our slide or our website. Sure. Is there a, do you have any framework on how you uh, anticipate on working with businesses as 
far as submitting proposals and is there any limits of how many proposals can be submitted and can you know grants be used as another part of funding to you know meet some of that matching? Yeah, so um, a couple of things, so that's a good question. So there is a project labor agreement that the city has already adopted for the funds. Um, so that covers the non-housing portion of the 70 million. So anything that's not for housing will be covered under the PLA. It's the first PLA in the, project in the city's history, so it's interesting. Um, but that covers the local hire side. It doesn't necessarily include the local contracting side, and so we get that. Um, there are some goals that the state sets forward. Could you go back like three or four slides? To oh, <coughs> Sorry. Um, okay. So on this side, and I'm sorry I didn't go through this before. These are the ten strategies that the state expects to see in the funding proposal. And a lot of them are state speak, and we can try to translate that. But this last one says high quality job creation and local economic development. And so the state has some expectations that we're gonna be working with local contractors, working with local businesses on this process. They don't really clearly step forward the path for what that looks like. I mean, so it's still vague. I mean there's not a lot of detail into how your you know initiative is going to be to work with businesses just an outline draft of what you have on the right. website. Right. Yeah. Even the PLA it's, it still doesn't have a definite definition on it. You know, but from a local level, like we're here having open discussion, right. you know, can we get a little bit more better information on, on how you anticipate to work with you know, small businesses, or at least within sure. the network we have here? It's, it's, hard for us as the, um, it's hard for us at this point to be able to say that because it's really project and context specific. So my suggestion would be to come to the workshops next week because a lot of that is going to be figured out at the project level and not at the sort of large scale process level. One more thing, is there going to be like pre-qualification to kind of see what interested businesses might meet some of those qualifications that could work with the city on the level that they want them to be on? I can't speak to the city's specific contracting practices, but I think we should, we should put that on the list of things. So once the uh, city identifies the uh, $70 million worth of projects, the uh, state of California still needs to approve them, right? Right. Yeah. So, they, so after October 18th, with the concept proposal, so we're working on a concept proposal to the state. After that, they have essentially a week to look at what we've submitted, give us their feedback, and then turn that feedback around. Then we have until November 30th, to basically finalize, you know, make, the, make changes if they suggest changes, and then submit the full application on November 30th. And the difference between concept and full is really a, um, we know that by uh, October 18th, your projects aren't going to be fully ready for funding. They're not going to be shovel ready, most of them. There will be some that will be, but um, the state's not requiring that all of them are shovel ready at that point. But by November 30th, you have to have 60% Is there a uh, desired ratio as, as to how many infrastructure projects they want, like 70% and like 25% technical assistance? So, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. So the ratio they have in the last guidelines is around readiness, and it's agnostic to, in some ways, to the types of projects. So they, they want, at the time of full application, 60% of the projects Ready, according to the way that they define shovel ready. 40% don't. You have to have three project types that meet all of the readiness criteria. So you would have to have at least one you know, affordable housing project that meets all the readiness criteria, one, you know, just in hypothetical terms, park, and one you know, street project that meets the readiness criteria by um, November. Other questions? Suggestions? This is a lot to undertake. Okay. 
that, and then partnering with the community development organization to share their capacity with the community development corporation and even some of the developer development fees so that those community development corporations begin to generate resources and have a capacity of their own. That type of model is something that ideally will, will come out of this TCC process so that when we look back over our shoulders, when we look back, what we hope to see is that there is capacity of community organizations that has been increased. And as we look forward, what we look at is that we will be positioned in a way that will be competitive for this grant and these types of grants in the future with increasingly robust and high capacity community organizations. Can I add something? I think one of the things is that you know everybody's been looking at you know, this project really uh, heavily is that there's a there's a need for you know change and so you know there's a big expectation here on the city that you know bringing that change you know to a certain you know particular area that you know doesn't have a lot of opportunities and you know there's only you know there's really two important things on the table that I can address which is either the jobs and you know some kind of other you know training that would you know give that area a little bit more uh, an economical you know playing field because the transparency you know is not going to be there and you know at the end when all the funding is run out you know what other you know future goals that you know the city is going to have in place that maybe they can have their own community development organization in those targeted areas, those underserved areas, so that they're not relying on the city to micromanage them, or they can kind of, you know, govern their own self and, you know, kind of change and do what's best what they need in their own area to kind of set up their own independent agencies. I think that would be you know, the, the long-term goal of things. That's a goal. That's a goal. Yeah, and Marshall, you know, my background is not city, so my background is developing community development corporations and organizations that are resident-led and owned and operated. And so what I said earlier, obviously I didn't communicate that well, and probably a big part of that is that it's a little bit unusual for a city to act like that, but great cities are doing this across the country. And so yes, we want to see community development corporations, and, and I'll just say that we know that when you develop a community, when you develop multiple community development, I mean, a healthy city, we, we've got, if you, if you look at the TCC guidelines and you look at the Calaviro screen, 40% of our community is in, a, is in the top 5% of most challenged uh, communities in California. That's unacceptable. But that means that we have multiple neighborhoods that are low capacity. And so we, our city desperately needs uh, robust, resilient community uh, neighborhood associations, community development corporations, PBIDs, et cetera. So part of the city's commitment to this process is that. Now another piece of that, another piece is jobs, actual jobs for the project, for these projects as they roll out. And I would just say that your, your Fresno Metro Black Chamber is right on target when you're looking at DBE and you're looking at increasing the capacity of women-owned businesses. Um, and we've already had a meeting with our DBE folks in the city. But I'll just, I'll just say this, that, uh, and I'm not an expert in DBE contracting, but again, it's, it is uh, doing the dance so that DBE contractors can be a part of larger contracts. The city can, needs to advocate for that but also having a Chamber of Commerce that is advocating and is on that and, and figuring out those connections and contracts so that local businesses and local workers can get jobs.
that's another, that's a whole other stream that's very important to this process and processes that succeed. Yes. And if I may add, <clears throat> this would be a, a very good time to talk about our member first procurement policy, which we launched uh, last month. So all of the money that comes into the Fresno Metro Black Chamber through contracts, subcontracts, um, or grants, when we look to spend that money, we are putting the RFP, the bid, the quote, out to our membership first. If we cannot get it through our membership, then we will look to the outside. We are hoping to um, grow that process and grow that program. And this project uh, would be we hope will be um, a huge pipeline uh, for our member businesses to be able to be engaged and involved in the process. Yes, I, I have one other question. So given that the state is the funder, are they going to provide anything in addition to the funding? Are they doing any oversight? Are they providing additional guidelines? What are the, what are the kinds of, of structures that are in place? To, that Fresno will have to adhere to in order to make sure for them that, that their requirements are met. So there's, um, if I understand your question correctly, so once the grant is funded, then there is ongoing grant administration and grant agreement that can sign between, we want to say that this, the cities believe that they're really the, the main signer of the grant agreement, and um, I'm a little unclear on how that relates to the collaborative stakeholder structure. Um, that's partially my ignorance on that section of the guidelines. But all this to say that through the grant administration process, there's an ongoing um, I mean, oversight role that they play in making sure that you know, all of these things that are lined up in the agreement, what is the city um, meeting its community engagement that required these Study meeting gets displaced with what it's meant, which is another requirement of the proposal. All of that is part of that grant administration. Um, you know, as a person who's gone through that before with the, with the state, I mean, they, they can play an active role. So there is an oversight committee that's going to be watching and making sure that these are like from, from TCC? So from the state side, that role gets played through their grant administration. Mm -hmm. From the local side, that is the collaborative stakeholder structure. They are the, the overseer, so to speak, of how these funds get distributed going forward. Yeah. Hi, I have a quick question, Danielle. Good morning. Um, so is this going to be the same process for the other millions of dollars that's still coming down the pipeline uh, it, through the same process? Because there is more money that's coming to Fresno. Are we going to do this same process every time? Or is this kind of just a one-time thing, or we're trying it out and just seeing how it goes? That's a really good question. I won't speak on behalf of this. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble. Okay. But I will say one thing, which is that um, to get the city to be in this place, it was not easy. Okay. So it's a sell, and I think you know, I think everyone wants success here. So I think this is a this is a pilot. Okay. Yeah. So um, the. The work that's been done, Fresno is the other California, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, San Joaquin Valley is the other California. So what has, what has put Fresno on the map to get us in line for these funds and for some of the other funds? And I would just say that um, a big part of that, so I ran for mayor, right? And part of running for mayor, you vet the city. <laughs> And what I discovered was is that, especially in this last administration under Mayor Swearingen, um, there was some heavy persuasion at the governor level and on down that about two things. One is that Fresno has been uh, disenfranchised and has has not been the recipient of a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And number two, that Fresno's ready. So the fact that all of y'all, many of y'all were a part of passing the general plan, 
I don't know if you, I mean, but that, that is directly related to this because when the general plan, the 2035 general plan was passed, it basically said, we're going to stop putting all of our, 100% of our development resources at the perimeter and this crazy northward expansion or peripheral expansion, and we're going to take at least 45 to 50 percent of those resources and focus them on underdeveloped neighborhoods that have been left behind. That is a huge piece. That plus the Fulton Mall plus support for the high-speed rail and other things. The mayor basically made the case that Fresno deserves 300 and needs 300 million dollars to turn itself around and have a healthy community. Long term, what that means for, for this type of project is, from the mayor's perspective, is that, there, that we build a development corridor between downtown Chinatown and West Fresno so that over a period of years, hopefully if we use these funds wisely, leverage them, and see results, that, that there will be other ways of funding and that, uh, that that corridor will result in development uh, all along that corridor for years to come. That's the hope. And that requires robust community organizations and all that goes with that. But it also requires that we get results in terms of projects, completed projects, that each project has merit on its own, but then the projects that are chosen end up being one plus one plus one equals nine. There's synergy so that, that we really maximize the impact of this round so that we can put ourselves in good, good stead for the next. There are cities in California that resent the fact yeah. that smart people like Danielle and Ashley and others in our administration and at the foundation and in the community have um, have gotten half of the TCC money for Fresno. So this is a competitive deal and we'll continue. To and the rest of the money that's coming to Fresno. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't want to monopolize, but I think it's important to use to know that the Calen viral screen is really what self-selected Fresno. And part of the reason that Southwest Fresno really needs the investment is because the 93706 zip code is at the top of the list for the most impact. And so as we think about where we want to see the investment and how it really does transform the community, which is the intent of the bill, I'm thinking about folks who get ready to do school shopping for their kids. And every kid may have a different need, but if, if one kid has five pairs of shoes and one kid doesn't have any shoes that are fitting, the priority probably needs to be the kid who needs some shoes that fit. And so West Fresno and Southwest Fresno is right now the kid that has no shoes that fit. We haven't been invested in, and so there just are greater needs for infrastructure and those kinds of basic things that would change and really transform the community. And so building the pipeline for economic development and connecting West Fresno with downtown absolutely makes sense and I think it does transform our city but I would just say that the investment the greatest portion of the investment ought to go to the place that has the greatest need and that's to me that just makes the most sense and I'm just hoping that because we're the Southwest Pacific plan has done some of that planning and really came out of the outgrowth of the general plan that we recognize that there's work that's been invested in already that's identified these projects. And what we've seen is that the investment doesn't start from somewhere else that sort of filter downward. It actually has to be intentional to start somewhere and then build it to the places where their connections need to be. And so to me, that's, that's part of the, the ability of this money is to, to support the Southwest specific plan because otherwise, the question becomes, how do we fund that plan? So, and, and I think to, to piggyback on that a little bit is what, what I think we were missing in some of this when you talk about economic development and downtown. I've talked to Swearingen and she's talked about housing next to downtown and high-speed rail. What we're really forgetting is 93706 
has the most extreme impact of this, and we're not talking about them as much. I know that we're doing the steering committee, and that's what this is for. We've had this conversation before, so hopefully that will align. But the heart of what you guys are missing, I think, sometimes when we're talking about this, is that you have um, a highly polluted area where people are dying. And so what I'm missing every time I'm going to these meetings, and every time I'm hearing UCs or UDNL or talking to Square Engineer Bates, is that we're forgetting that the impact in 9706 is not just a fluff area that you guys are overlooking. What we're trying to tell you is that there's people that are dying there. Okay, children, kids, asthma, you know, parks, air quality, water quality. I mean, we're talking about some real heart issues. And I think when, when some of you like to get really caught up in the economics of the downtown and high-speed rail, I think what happens time and time again in these conversations is you forget the heart of the people that are dying over there that have been disenfranchised for so long, and you just want to talk about this infrastructure. We need to make sure that someone on your team has a heart to say people are dying, and that's also a concern for our city. Stacy, the fact that um, you can articulate that is awesome. And but I would just say that that is connected and connects West Fresno to the rest of the city and to the market forces that, it, that the people of West Fresno deserve to be a part of. So I don't think there's any, um, there's no ignoring the issue and the fact that the process is structured to be able to elicit comments like this, I think, goes well for our city. So thank you. Is there going to be anything put in place to prevent, you know, through this process, gentrification? Because, you know, I used to work with minority contractors in San Francisco and flat out watched, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, what happened to the film. I still call it the film war, now called the Western Edition. You know, watching exactly what happened. And they were being pushed out uh, during these improvements. Uh, what are they putting in place, you know, to try and prevent that from happening? So one of the requirements that the state has put in their funding guidelines is that this, the um, application that's submitted to the state includes a displacement avoidance plan. And so there's a lot of different components of that. Part of that is protecting existing residents and making sure that you know, people are getting unfairly evicted and that sort of thing. Part of that is a focus on protecting existing businesses and what programs do you have in place to make sure that businesses are again, getting unfairly evicted, et cetera. Um, Part of that is a question of how do you create new opportunities for people to stay, so that's around new affordable housing, um, and then how do you preserve the sort of rural character of, of the community, and so you know, there's, that is a required component. It will be part of the oversight the initiative going forward. Um, you know, I think it's a, in my mind, it's a, it's a conversation that's been bubbling under the surface for a long time but hasn't really, until now, I think really popped up. And um, I think there's a lot more intentional dialogue that needs to happen here locally about how we do that well, and what, what we need to do. Because I think it's one thing to kind of say that this is happening or isn't happening, and I think it's easy for people to get bogged down into the, is Fresno gentrified, is Fresno not gentrified? But I think now that we're kind of in the place of like, okay, we all know we don't want that to happen, then what do we actually need to do? That's what's needed. And I'll just go back to, um, first of all, Fresno is very different than San Francisco. Oh, I know, I know. And, and I think one of, the, one of the ways that we're different that is hopeful is that when you look at a Google Maps, look at Chinatown, downtown, even southwest Fresno, you see land. I mean, most of the most of the 400 units that have been built downtown um, were, didn't displace any of them because there was just space, right? So the, I think the opportunity that we have that places like San Francisco no longer have, I mean, it, you know, when I, I work with communities, I work with East Palo Alto, and East Palo Alto is, is being gobbled up by Facebook, Google, and everybody else. It's, a, it's, a, it's an island of poverty and a sea of prosperity, and at the same time, cops and teachers can't afford to live in any of those communities anymore. So, but here, I think 
to really get to your question, we have to think hard about how to institutionalize affordable housing now. And if we don't have a, a vision for mixed income communities as being the health and future of Fresno, then we will be in trouble. So th this gives us an opportunity with some of the housing opportunities to include affordability in there. I'll give you an, an example with Lowell. Lowell is one of the only three elementary school neighborhoods within the triangle downtown. The Housing Authority, in conjunction with the Lowell CDC, just built two projects that have that are totally affordability oriented. That, that type of planning and advocacy and commitment is what's going to what it's going to take. Well, the reason why I say that is because you know this is exactly how it was built in San Francisco. That affordable housing, which you know, since I was looking at plans and seeing all, all that stuff, I knew exactly that it wasn't. But it was being built that way, and that's how it happened. So that's why I'm... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a board member with the Black Chamber. I think my main concern is getting businesses and residents uh, care, you know, to that August 15th and 16th workshop. Because we can talk about process and making sure that everything is in place. But then if our small businesses don't show up to the 15th and or the 16th workshop, then you have this really nice, pretty process in place with all the right rules. And then the businesses don't have, right, you know, to make sure that they know um, that if you have an idea, you know, if you're a general contractor or a business or, for example, with, you know, Legal Shield, maybe Legal Shield wants to open up in, in Chinatown or Southwest Fresno or close to FCC with me, then Legal Shield, you need to have your plan looked at on the 15th and the 16th because that's your option. I'm just picking up. <laughs> that, that's your opportunity to, okay, here's our plan. Um, TCC, the state, take a look at my plan. It's your opportunity to get that feedback. 